I was born in a unique time in regard to Star Wars. The original trilogy was completed before I was born, and The Phantom Menace came out when I was 14. Jedi were my heroes. They were everyone's heroes. But I grew up. Life became more than just homework, riding bikes, and holding hands. As well as the films I loved expanded beyond space ninjas and laser swords. I saw a dark knight rise. Two men of steel crumble. Barefoot many people ride giant eagles. Big business clashed with the American dream. And a long trek came to a halt. And along the way that music came back. Great as they were, they weren't the same. Maybe I became more cynical. Maybe I stopped being so naive. Naive. Or maybe it was an inside joke that was meant to be seen all along. We would be honored if you would join us. And yeah, I get it. They are films. They play to our emotions. Logic isn't exactly what they are all about. This is madness. But if you look at things with a little less emotion. Don't let your personal feelings get in the way. A little bit more logic. Come to your senses. And a tiny spoonful of real world events. That's right. You see it. You see it pretty clearly. You see that the Empire was right. And just to clarify things ahead of time, I am merely talking about the live-action, theatrically released films. No comic books, TV series, made-for-TV films, or novels. Just the films. And while the connection is implied, the First Order does not have a definitive connection to the Empire, and as such, will not be directly referenced, for better or worse, in connection with the Empire. And your journey towards the dark side will be complete. Also, I am not implying that the Empire, Sith, or their associates are perfectly good. And I'm not saying the Jedi, Rebels, or their associates are perfectly evil. But each opposing force sits squarely on a spectrum. With the Empire leaning towards the morally justified side, and the Rebels and Jedi leaning more towards the warmongering, bloodthirsty, child molester side. First and foremost, I'm going to start with an obvious point. What makes the Jedi so good? They call themselves the peacekeepers of the galaxy. We're keepers of the peace. But they are quite violent. In A New Hope, Obi-Wan makes the first blow against Vader. And in The Phantom Menace, Palpatine tells Darth Maul not to attack first. And once you know, when he encounters Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon, Obi-Wan attacks him first. Just for the sake of comparison, Darth Maul even goes out of his way to avoid making contact during portions of this fight. But on a broader level, the Jedi initially maintained order for the sake of the Republic. But the Republic is deeply flawed. The Republic is not what it once was. It has no interest in the common good. There is no interest in the common good. And is run by bureaucrats. The bureaucrats are in charge now. The same Republic also sits by idly as the Trade Federation lays siege to Naboo. A tragedy has occurred, which started right here with the taxation of trade routes and has now engulfed our entire planet in the oppression of the Trade Federation. But looking at the Jedi on their own, I'm at a loss for what is so righteous about them. At best, they are a part of the Republic's military. But then they are only as good as the Republic itself. At worst, they are a cult that brainwashes children at a very young age, as even Anakin Skywalker was initially too old for the Jedi. He is to be trained then? No. He will not be trained. No. He is too old. I am all for people finding peace through religion, but the Jedi do play it fast and loose with their timing. Look no further than Obi-Wan taking advantage of Luke wanting to know his father. What is it? Your father's lightsaber. This is the weapon of a Jedi Knight. And then catapulting off the untimely death of his aunt and uncle, this is quite the predatory situation to trick somebody into a religion. But it doesn't end there. Who says the Jedi are right? Pretty much only them. For over a thousand generations, the Jedi Knights were the guardians of peace and justice in the old Republic. And who says the Sith and Empire are evil? Pretty much just the Jedi and Rebels. Destroy the Sith. We must. Send me to kill the Emperor. We are fed a narrative from only one side. Pure propaganda, to say the least. And on a side note, 
it is outrageous to justify the dark side as evil just because it is called the dark side. I see through the lies of the Jedi. I do not fear the dark side as you do. But I digress. When Luke and Obi-Wan come to the destroyed sand crawler on Tatooine, Luke makes the astute observation that it was an attack by sand people. It looks like the sand people did this all right. Look, there's gaffy sticks, fanta tracks. It's just, I've never heard of them hitting anything this big before. Obi-Wan provides a valid counter-argument. Even though in combat, formations can and do easily alter based on circumstance. But we are meant to think they did. These tracks are side by side. Sand people always ride single file to hide their numbers. But Obi-Wan makes a pretty baseless remark about how only stormtroopers can be so precise. And these blast points, too accurate for sand people. Only Imperial stormtroopers are so precise. But there are a few problems with this argument. One, stormtroopers being precise does not mean others cannot be precise. Two, he makes a blanket statement that sand people cannot shoot precisely. Even though I know some pod racers that can disagree with that. And three, Obi-Wan uses a lack of evidence to further his agenda instead of relying on true evidence. But here's where things get interesting. Luke goes to see that his aunt and uncle have been killed. Burned to a crisp, by the way. Something that stormtroopers are never seen doing in any other encounters, which is odd. But even more odd, Luke returns to the sandcrawler and Obi-Wan begins the conversation, as if he already knew they were dead. There's nothing you could have done, Luke, had you been there. You'd have been killed, too. Pretty ironic if you ask me that the last time Obi-Wan sees Anakin, he is burning to death and literally on fire. and Anakin's brother ends up burned to nothing but his bones. And Obi-Wan seems to be in close proximity for both events. Well, of course I know him. He's me. I will continue this argument later on. But now let's go to probably the most misconstrued aspect of the Empire, the Death Star. The Death Star in itself is emphatic proof of the Empire being moral and anti-war. This is made obvious by the fact that the Death Star was already under construction during the end of Revenge of the Sith, and not ready until the events of Rogue One. It was under construction for over 20 years. For a military with the resources of an entire galaxy at its disposal, and a military that is dealing with a well-equipped rebellion, it should have been a top construction priority, unless violence was not the main objective of the Empire. Very interesting. Once again, the Separatists have been engaging in a civil war against the Empire for over two decades. No different than how the United States dealt with the Confederate Separatists during the American Civil War. The operative word is war. Unfortunate things happen in war. During the American Civil War, the Union General William Sherman destroyed the city of Atlanta, and his troops went on a 30-mile march to the Atlantic Ocean, destroying everything in their way. So while the amount of death and destruction is incalculable, it was an event that led to a morale boost for the Union, secured Lincoln's re-election, and was a turning point in the war that almost certainly secured victory for the Union. The same can be said about the destruction of Alderaan. It was cold, callous, and reprehensible. But like all wars, it was an event that showed the galaxy that the Empire was willing to go to great lengths for reunification. <laughs> I feel a quote by America's greatest president, Abraham Lincoln, further emphasizes this point. I would save the Union. I would save it in the shortest way. The sooner the national authority can be restored, the nearer the Union will be to the Union as it was. And to address the Death Star more broadly, Tarkin made it very clear that the Death Star was to bring a swift end to the rebellion. With a weapon that will bring a swift end to the rebellion. A swift end to an already over 20 year war. Plus, Alderaan made the perfect target as it was both separatist and had a low population. I have chosen to test this station's destructive power on your home planet of Alderaan. Obi-Wan, while a clear antagonist of the Empire, was at the very least Force-sensitive. He remarked how he sensed the casualties of Alderaan as only in the millions. As if millions of voices were suddenly silenced. To dissect that statement even further, if there were 10 million or more people on Alderaan, then he would have said tens of millions. If there were more than 6 million people, he would have said over half a dozen million. If there were 2 million, he would have said a couple million. And if there were 3 to 5 million, he would have said a few million. Numbers don't lie. 
Obi-Wan clearly implies that Alderaan had less than two million inhabitants. If millions of voices, if millions of voices, if millions of voices. So it makes sense. Alderaan was the best possible target to minimize civilian casualties and bring a swift end to the rebellion. It is clear that the Empire cautiously and responsibly chose a target of minimal casualties. Princess Leia, on the other hand, showed her true maniacal nature by being literally unfazed by the events. Yes, she was momentarily distraught that her planet possessions and loved ones were sacrificed in the name of peace to the Empire. No. But she never makes another mention or sign of sadness regarding the event. In fact, the only other time she brings up Alderaan is to chastise a rebel commander for showing his sympathies. You're safe. When we heard about Alderaan, we feared the worst. We have no time for Asara's commander. While on the topic of Leia, what type of hero is she? Not any real hero in my book. Why are you still here? She is a legitimate fan of incest. Mm -hmm. And it isn't that she was naive about it, because she knew they were related all along. Somehow, I've always known. And on top of that, she lied about knowing her mother. She was very beautiful, kind. Sad. When we all know that is a lie. And in five freaking films, how does she use the Force? She uses it once and it is to save herself. Also, she is a Force damned adulterer. Look at her, she has the face and body of a goddess. And look at her mate. Quite an attractive guy if I say so myself. Convenient. Now look at their kid. You know I can take whatever I want. In the real world, Carrie Fisher was snorting coke off of Harrison Ford's lightsaber, if you get what I mean. But in the world of Star Wars, it looks like Princess Leia put something scruffy looking in her nerf herder. Now to shift gears a bit. As things go regarding the Empire, all logical evidence points to a loving and merciful government. For starters, look at how Vader dealt with Leia and the stolen Death Star plans. He commandeered the ship when destroying it would have been easier and still kept the plans away from the rebels. During the same encounter, at best, the stormtroopers provide suppressive fire and things do not escalate until the bloodthirsty rebels make the first fatal shot. And let's keep in mind, the rebels stole the plans to the Death Star, a legitimate weapon of mass destruction. And much like how the real world wants to keep weapons of mass destruction out of the maniacal hands of North Korea, Iran, and Iraq under Saddam Hussein, the Galactic Empire wanted to keep that technology away from the warmongering rebels. But back to the peace and love of the Empire. They are job creators. These massive ships and space stations are not being built for free. As well as, let's be honest, there isn't much indication that life under the Empire is that bad after all. When I see the Empire, I see an Imperial shuttle parking a polite distance from Galen Urso's house. I see a gracious host standing to greet his guests. We would be honored if you would join us. I see the government outsourcing work to private citizens. There will be a substantial reward for the one who finds the Millennium Falcon. I see the government helping a youth get a job and an identity. What's your name, son? Han. Han what? Who are your people? I don't have people. I'm alone. Um. Solo. I see secular government crushing religious fanaticism. The holy city will be enough for today. Target Jeddah city, prepare single reactor ignition. I see a stormtrooper guiding traffic. I see a garbage compactor not being used so a creature can live in it. I see a government that believes in smaller government. The rebellion will continue to gain a support in the Imperial Senate. The Imperial as Senate will no longer be of any concern to us. I have just received word that the Emperor has dissolved the Council permanently. The last remnants of the Old Republic have been swept away. Well, it's impossible. How will the Emperor maintain control without the bureaucracy? The regional governors now have direct control over their territories. 
I see the will of the people come to fruition, as the empire is created by the democratically elected Senate and, by definition, is the will of the people. The Republic will be reorganized into the first galactic empire for a safe and secure society. But let's move on. The peace-loving and virtuous nature of the Empire can best be seen by looking at how vile and corrupt the Rebel Alliance is. There will be no extraction. You find him, you kill him. This is the part where you probably are saying, being a rebel isn't bad, America exists because of a rebellion. I say we fight! Yeah, great point. America is the result of a rebellion. Rebellions are built on hope. Then again, the Nazis started as a rebellion. Rebellions are built on hope. As did the Confederacy. Rebellions are built on hope. Lenin's communist rise to power in Russia was also a rebellion. Rebellions are built on hope. So was Mao Zedong's communist revolution. Rebellions are built on hope. Rebellion does not always equal good. Your fleet are rebel scum and war criminals. But to clear the air about the American rebellion against Britain, it was the American colonists fighting for their own independence from Britain. As history clearly shows, the British Empire survived the war, and there was still a functioning English government in Canada, Australia, India, and Britain itself. The warmongering rebel alliance wants to destroy the empire. The time to fight is now! Destroying the government of the entire galaxy. Send me to kill the emperor and essentially creating a system of chaos as they have not the slightest agenda on how to fill the massive power vacuum. Oh dear. But let's look at the different ships of the rebels and the empire, and you will clearly see which one wants war. There are the imperial ships. They are clearly not made for war. The TIE fighter has no shields, no side or rear visibility, only has forward-facing guns, it is easily destroyed, it has no faster-than-light travel, no, it's a short-range fighter, no droid integration, and no form of bombs or torpedoes. This ship is clearly meant to be used only as a last resort. I know these guys. I used to be one of them. There's no way they're going to waste a TIE fighter chasing down a little rinky-dink freighter. The Empire also has a TIE interceptor. It is in the name. The sole purpose is to intercept. Then there is the Rebellion's X-Wing. Talk about a ship made for war. It has shields, droid-assisted flight, faster-than-light travel, four, yep, I said it, four gun turrets, plus the capacity to fire torpedoes. And then there are the respective big ships. The Rebels have Mon Calamari cruisers, and the Empire has Star Destroyers. The Empire gave Star Destroyers a scary name for the sake of stopping conflicts before they even start. Seriously ask yourself, what name is more likely to scare you, as in give you a reason not to fight? A Star Destroyer or a Mon Calamari Cruiser? I don't know about you, but if I was told I would fight a Star Destroyer, I would think twice. A wimpy name like a Mon Calamari Cruiser is essentially begging for me to fight it. And that is what the hate-filled rebels want. More violence. Now I do have to concede slightly to the rebels. They have medical frigates to take care of the wounded, and the Empire does not. However, the peace-loving empire doesn't need such ships since they do not rely on violence to get their way. The violent rebels who crave death and destruction would need a way to serve their wounded. But on a broader level, we can see how the filmmakers subtly told us who was good and evil. The empire shoots green lasers, which mean go in peace. Prepare for jump to hyperspace! while the rebels shoot red lasers, which means stop and die. <laughs> Even looking at the lightsabers is further proof of this. In The Phantom Menace between Qui-Gon, Obi-Wan, and Darth Maul, the lightsabers provide the same subtle meaning, with Maul's saber coloring implying stop, stop, I do not want to hurt you, with the Jedi lightsaber subtly saying, I will fight you so hard that you will feel blue, and go and die. But the rebels are more than just their ships and sabers. A key part of the Rebellion is the Millennium Falcon and its two pilots, Han Solo and Lando Calrissian. Captain Lando Calrissian. Han Solo. Han Solo attacked Vader during the attack on the first Death Star, which allowed Luke Skywalker to destroy the Death Star. What? Yeah Look out! Han Solo is a truly vile person. You rebel scum. For no fault of his own, he was an orphaned thief on Corellia. I ran away, and then I boosted their speeder. And in his moment of most need, the Empire was there to get him off of Corellia, and even gave him a name. A 
approved. Proceed to transport ID 83 for the Naval Academy at Corita. Good luck, Han Solo. We'll have you flying in no time. But he unrighteously deserted his post. You're not Imperial Army. Your thieves here to steal equipment for a job, and I want it. He went on to raid an Imperial shipment of coaxium. Lest we not forget, he later goes on to unlawfully release the thief and spy Princess Leia from the first Death Star. I don't know who you are or where you came from, but from now on, you do as I tell you, okay? No reward is worth this. If one Death Star wasn't enough to destroy, he also leads the invading force that destroys the shield generator on Endor. During this attack on Endor, he recruits the primitive natives to engage in his hostilities. All right, move it. that result in countless deaths of natives, as well as brave and loving stormtroopers. Ah! Then there is Lando Calrissian. I'm Lando Calrissian. The previous owner of the Millennium Falcon. What have you done to my ship? Your ship? Hey, remember you lost her to me fair and square. As well as a thief and cheat in his own right. This card player, gambler, scoundrel, you'd like him. His own friends, Han and Leia, do not trust him, which is very telling in itself. I don't trust Lando. Well, I don't trust him either. But he makes the right call by handing over these war criminals to Vader. I had no choice. They arrived right before you did. But then goes on to betray Vader and the Empire by helping them escape. Well done. He then takes it upon himself to destroy the second Death Star. But regarding Lando and Han, it is tough to say if they are equally conniving in their thirst for power, or the rebels are just ineffective. But by the attack on the second Death Star, both are generals. General Calrissian has volunteered to lead the fighter attack. Good luck. General Solo, is your strike team assembled? Let's dissect why this is messed up. For starters, Han Solo's a captain during the Battle of Hoth, in which he engaged in zero combat. Captain Solo. Do you copy? He then leaves the rebellion. You're a good fighter, Solo. I hate to lose you. Thank you, General. He is frozen in carbonite. Yes, he's alive. Thought out. And on his next meeting with the rebels is somehow a general. General Solo. Lando, on the other hand, betrays the rebels by handing over Leia and Han to the Empire. Noble and commendable, might I add. I had no choice. They arrived right before you did. Sadly, he then frees them from the warm and loving arms of the Empire. Well done. To continue on his betrayal to the Empire, he helps rescue Han from his hibernation in carbonite. And then he meets up with the rebels and is a general. General Calrissian. Also, what organized and valid military gives the command of his spaceship to someone on their first day with no training or valid credentials beyond somebody's word? Are you sure you can handle this ship, sir? Luke is the best bush pilot in the outer rim territories. It seems getting a ship or leadership position in the Rebel Alliance is easier than getting Chewbacca to cover up his genitals. Speaking of Chewbacca, it is important to squash a very false rumor about the Empire. With the rumor being that the Empire engaged in systematic genocide, slavery, and has a pro-human agenda. First of all, those are all false. But just to be clear, there is no evidence whatsoever of the Empire engaging in such despicable actions. The proof is in the pudding, and the pudding is in the name. The name is the Galactic Empire, not the Human Empire. It was plenty of non-humans that gave Palpatine his power. In order to ensure the security and continuing stability, the Republic will be reorganized into the first galactic empire for a safe and secure society. Regarding systematic genocide and slavery, there is no evidence whatsoever of either of these taking place in any of the ten Star Wars films. But what about the Wookiees, you say? Well, for starters, they are not people in any sense of the word. They live in trees, like monkeys. They also have not evolved pants. Pants are pretty important. They are what separates us from the beasts. 
And well, the Wookiees don't have pants, and neither do cows. They also do not have the capacity for formal conversation. They communicate with moans and grunts, no different than the ones that your mom makes when the mailman is five fingers deep inside of her while your daddy is at work. Now let's move on to Emperor Palpatine. Talk about a misunderstood genius. Everything is proceeding as I have foreseen. First of all, Senator Palpatine was nominated to the position of Chancellor. He did not actively seek it. Your Highness, Senator Palpatine has been nominated to succeed Valorum as Supreme Chancellor. A surprise, to be sure, but a welcome one. But when he became Chancellor, he sought to take away power from the bureaucrats that were ruling the Senate. A stronger Supreme Chancellor, one who could control the bureaucrats. He intended to put an end to corruption. I promise to put an end to corruption. Also, let us not forget, Palpatine wanted to keep the Republic united. In order to ensure the security and continuing stability, the Republic will be reorganized. And whether or not Palpatine wanted supreme authority, it was the Senate that granted it, and as such, he became the democratically elected leader of the Republic. Misa proposed that the Senate give immediately emergency powers to the Supreme Chancellor. <laughs> Furthermore, he was very clear about his love for democracy and the Republic. I love democracy. I love the Republic. As well as he would relinquish control after the Separatists stopped. The power you give me, I will lay down when this crisis has abated. It is ironic that the Separatists had the goal of removing Palpatine from power, but it was their very violence that kept him in power. It was the hyper-violent Jedi that escalated things. To them, the death of General Grievous was enough for Palpatine to relinquish power. If he does not give up his emergency powers after the destruction of Grievous, then he should be removed from office. But that was far from the Separatists being stopped. Which brings us back to the Jedi. The Jedi clearly do not want peace. Once more, the Sith will rule the galaxy. And we shall have peace. As it would lead to an end of the Jedi being needed. For over a thousand generations, the Jedi Knights were the guardians of peace and justice. Remember, it was Mace Windu, a Jedi, as well as other Jedis that wanted to execute Palpatine without trial or conviction. He has control of the Senate and the courts. He's too dangerous to be left alive. Literally going against the rule of law. It's treason, then. But the Jedi are more than warmongers. They are irresponsibly illogical. Look at Luke Skywalker. In A New Hope and The Empire Strikes Back, he is seen having training that does not even last for a week. And he is made well aware that he has not finished training. Luke, you must complete the training. But when he returns for training in Return of the Jedi, now I get how they got that name. But I need your help. I've come back to complete the training. He is supposedly fully trained. No more training do you require. To me, that is a major logical fallacy. But you do not need a PhD in Star Wars to know that Luke becomes a very dangerous person with such little training. The Jedi did this on purpose. They instilled these violent and aggressive traits into young children, which unfortunately led to their unnecessary slaughter by Anakin Skywalker. Had the Jedi been responsible and reasonable in their training, all of those younglings would have been spared. Look at this youngling. He is violent and practically unstoppable because of his training. His training, by the way, that is reminiscent of none other than the Hitler Youth. But the Jedi and their corruption go beyond that. They bastardized the Force. They only study half of it, while the Sith study all of it. If one is to understand the great mystery, one must study all its aspects, not just the dogmatic narrow view of the Jedi. The Jedi forbid attachment and love. Attachments forbidden. Possession is forbidden. Which is not exactly a time-tested system. There is a particular religion in the real world that also forbids its leaders from love and attachment. On paper, it sounds good but thousands of children with bruised buttholes say otherwise. However, the Sith are different. They allow love. They allow passion. The Sith rely on their passion for their strength. They even bring the dead back to life. 
he could even keep the ones he cared about from dying. They believe in teamwork and work in pairs. Always do there are. No more, no less. So yes, Anakin did bring balance to the Force. He brought back the love and passion of the Force that the Jedi tried to destroy. As I round things out, it is worth noting a common phrase. History is written by the victors. And those victors are clearly the Empire and Sith. Sure, the Rebels had some victories here and there by destroying two Death Stars, but it isn't as if the Empire just collapsed after the passing of the Emperor at the hands of Vader while going insane in his last few moments. The First Order and Supreme Leader Snoke took the reins and essentially became the reincarnation of the Empire. Yes, the First Order is not the Empire. While valid and just in its own merits, it is not the Empire. But the Rebellion persisted and fought the First Order as well. The Rebellion, that as of The Last Jedi, is merely a handful of people. So yes, history is written by the victors. Those victors being trillions upon trillions of citizens of the galaxy that watched as brave soldiers faithfully and bravely defended them until there were just a few small pockets of violent rebels left. And one more thing. How dumb are Owen and Beru Lars? They owned and lived with C-3PO, but they then buy a droid later on with the same name and voice and never think that it might be the same droid. But I was going into Toshi Station to pick up some power converters. Oh, how things would have been different if he just went to Toshi Station. Thanks for watching, and please check back often as sequel and rebuttal videos